All right, Bib 1001. Today we are going to be working with the 8th century prophets. Uh, that means we're going to be working with Amos and Hosea and Micah and Isaiah. And so we'll see if we can at least uh, get a little attention to each of these. So let me go ahead and give you the, the timeline. And I think you probably are getting this sketched in your mind fairly well. And so it looks something like this. And so we have the divided kingdom, and then we have the split took place about 930. You'll remember that Solomon was the king in 970. And if we go on back here at 1010, we have David. And so the big promise to David was the dynasty or the throne. The big promise to Solomon was with the temple. Of course, that's in Jerusalem. And then we have the kingdom split after Solomon. And so we end up with the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. So Israel to the north, Judah to the south. The line of David continues in Judah. This is where Jerusalem is. This is where the temple is at. Now we're jumping ahead a little bit. Uh, remember, the northern kingdom is going to come to an end in 722, going to be conquered by Assyria. The southern kingdom will continue until 587, and it will be conquered by Babylon. So Babylon conquers southern kingdom in 587, and then Assyria conquers the northern kingdom in 722. Now, the 8th century prophets are Amos, Hosea, Micah, and Isaiah. So our 8th century prophets, Amos and Hosea, and I put them up here on the top because they are the prophets to the northern kingdom, to Israel. And Micah and Isaiah they are the prophets to the southern kingdom at this time, 8th century. Uh, even though Hosea is listed first in our Old Testament, I went ahead and put Amos on top uh, because he prophesied before Hosea. He came on the scene first. Uh, these books, uh, Hosea through Malachi, they are not arranged in chronological order. Uh, rather, it's kind of the longest to the shortest. And so while well, you can't really even say that, and so, but Hosea is, is first, and then we get, but Amos was kind of on the scene first. And so that book is known as the Book of the Twelve. You can get more on that in Discovering the Old Testament. So we're going to talk a little bit about each of these. And for now, I want to call your attention to the main sin that they highlighted. So for Amos, he was actually not a professional prophet. He was a shepherd, and he also took care of sycamore fig trees. Um, but the Lord spoke to him and said, look, you need to go to the northern kingdom and deliver this series of messages to them. And so he goes. And the thing that he calls them out on is injustice. That the wealthy up in the northern kingdom were oppressing the poor. They were exploiting them, taking their land leaving them as basically peasants on their own land, abusing them. And so Amos calls them out for it, announces that judgment is going to come on the northern kingdom because of the injustices that are being practiced. For Hosea, the big sin that he identifies, and he's actually from the northern kingdom, the big sin that he identifies is basically the sin of betrayal. And so he sees what's going on. The Lord speaks to him about what's going on. And he delivers a message that judgment is coming because of the ways that they have betrayed the Lord. And he lays this out in two really powerful images. So one is betrayal in the sense of adultery. That the Lord is the husband, Israel is the wife. And Israel has been an unfaithful bride to the Lord, that they have gone after other lovers, other gods, other emperors, thinking that somehow they'll get a better life 
by going after these other lovers. And the Lord has Hosea marry a wife by the name of Gomer. And Gomer is a prostitute. She's unfaithful. She betrays him and goes after other lovers. And so Hosea's marriage to Gomer symbolizes what God is going through with Israel. And so Hosea speaks out of this. God speaks to him through this, reveals to him what's going on. And here's the amazing thing about it that a wife who commits adultery, the penalty for that was for her to be put to death. And Hosea instead is directed by the Lord to go buy Gomer back out of her prostitution and to retake her as his wife and to create a new marriage with her. And that, that becomes symbolic of what God intends to do with Israel. That though Israel has gone after these other lovers and God is going to kind of let her go to discover how bankrupt that is, then God is going to buy her out of that, bring her back out of that, and reestablish a new marriage, a new relationship with Israel. So Hosea's own experience with Gomer becomes prophetic, if you will, for what's going on with God and Israel. The second area of betrayal that Hosea identifies is that of the rebel son. And so he'll use this imagery. He'll use this imagery in chapter 11, and where God is the father, Israel is the son now. And God has been a good father to Israel, bringing them up out of Egypt, taking care of them. And yet Israel has been this rebellious son that constantly goes astray and turns away from the father. Again, Old Testament law, what do you do with a rebel son? A rebellious son becomes a threat to the stability of the whole family. And so for the sake of the family, you have to put that son to death. Otherwise, that son will make a wreck of the whole family, destroy the whole family. So Israel is this rebel son that God has been such a good father to, and yet they've been so rebellious that the penalty is they should be put to death. And yet God says, I can't do it. That I'm not man, I'm a holy God, I have too much compassion, too much love, that there's no way I can put my rebellious son to death. And so what God is going to do is punish and restore. And so we see the kind of the same thing in terms of the adulterous wife, the rebel son, both should be put to death for their be deep, deep betrayal of one who loves them so greatly, so dearly. And yeah, God's saying, I can't do it. And so the, the adulterous wife will be brought back. The rebel son will be brought back and restored. And so that's basically Hosea's message, that, there, that Israel's sins are atrocious and worthy of the death penalty. But because of who God is, there will be punishment for sure, but there will be restoration, that there will be a regathering, a renewal. And so this judgment, but with hope on the other side, with a saving purpose to the judgment. Okay, so that's Hosea. Uh, we go to the southern kingdom and we get Micah. And Micah was very similar to Amos, also concerned with injustice. He saw the same things going on in the south that the Lord revealed to Micah about the north, or excuse me, to Amos about the north. And so Micah announces judgment coming upon Jerusalem, judgment coming upon the southern kingdom of Judah because of the sins of oppression, the sins of injustice and exploitation. And then Isaiah is to the southern kingdom, and Isaiah's focus is on trust and especially with the kings of Jerusalem. Will they trust the security of their reign uh, to the Lord? Will they trust the future of Judah, Jerusalem, to the Lord? Or will they take things into their own hands and try to manufacture their own future? And so he calls them out on sins of lack of trust, and he encourages them to trust. And that's 8th century Isaiah. We'll talk a little bit more about Isaiah in a moment, uh, but for now, I want to direct your attention to Amos. In fact, 
go ahead and get your Bibles and turn to Amos. Uh, we're going to skim through and talk a little bit more about Amos. Uh, Amos just, he is amazing. And his, his boldness, his forthrightness, his courage, uh, just an amazing, amazing prophet. And I, several years ago, like 30 years ago, uh, I was reading through Amos and leading a Bible study through Amos on Sunday nights. And I was just so impressed with him that when Bon and I were expecting our first child, thought for sure it's going to be a boy and we're going to name him Amos. I couldn't really sell Vonda on the name Amos for some reason. Uh, I don't know what she had against that name, but she just didn't buy into it. And so but I was confident that and everybody was saying we're going to have a boy. And so I'm thinking we're going to name this kid Amos after Amos the prophet. He's so bold. He's so courageous. Well, we had Rebecca. Interesting. We couldn't agree on a girl's on a boy's name, but we could agree on a girl's name. And so Vonda gave birth to Rebecca. She was so happy that she didn't have to name her firstborn Amos. And I thought, okay, the second one, the second one will be Amos. And so a couple of years passed and Vaughn is pregnant again. And I'm still thinking about Amos and just his boldness, his courage to stand for the Lord and to speak forthrightly and to call for this, this repentance and this change. And so I'm thinking, okay, this time we're gonna have Amos. And I don't know why, but Vonda still hadn't warmed up to Amos yet. And lo and behold, she gave birth, and we had Rachel. I was really happy with Rachel. We could agree on the name Rachel. Um, but I'm thinking, man, Vonda, why, why are you so against Amos? And just such a powerful book and powerful person, powerful message. So another couple of years pass, and Vonda's pregnant again. And at this time, I'd kind of let go of Amos a little bit. And we had John Mark. And it's interesting. Uh, at that point, we couldn't really agree on a girl's name, but we had settled on John Mark and we had settled on that name together. And Vonda gave birth to John Mark. We waited on all three. We waited until they were born to discover their, their gender. And so we kind of had two sets of names that we were trying to pick out. Um, but each time the child was the name where we had agreement. Pretty interesting. Anyways, I tell you all that because even though I ne never named my children Amos, uh, there might be one of you, maybe many of you, that will name your firstborn Amos. So let's go ahead and turn there, and let me just give you a little bit of a walkthrough in terms of how Amos uh, functions or how he works. So the first couple chapters, Amos begins to announce judgment on all the peoples that are around Israel, all their neighboring nations, the ones that they consider to be rivals and sometimes threats or even enemies. And so he begins to announce that judgment is going to come on each and every one of them. So if you look with me, uh, verse 2 of chapter 1, and he said, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, the pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. So from all the way to Jerusalem up to the northern kingdom where Amos has been sent. And here's what he says. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. So I will send fire upon the house of Hazael and it shall devour the strongholds of Ben Hayden. Uh, down to verse six, you're going to see a pattern here. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they carried into exile a whole people to deliver them up to Edom. So I will send fire on them. Verse nine, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they delivered up a whole people to Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. So I will send fire. Verse 11, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity. Okay, and so I'm going to send fire on them. Verse 13, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the Ammonites and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have ripped open pregnant women in Gilead that they might enlarge their border. So I'm going to send fire on them. Chapter 2, verse 1, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab 
and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because he burned alive the bones of the king of Edom. So I will send fire. So basically what's going on here is that Amos is catching everybody's attention in this sermon by preaching that God's judgment is coming on all the peoples around them. And this is doing a couple things aside from getting their attention. Uh, number one, what we're seeing in here is that God is sovereign over all peoples, over all nations. And so God holds everyone accountable for their actions. All the nations, all the kings are accountable to God for how they exercise their authority, their rule, their power. The second thing we see in this is that the standard that they're held accountable to is basically a respect for the sanctity of life. And so where these kings, these peoples, these rulers overstep their boundaries in terms of uh, no regard for the covenant of brotherhood, no regard for life in the womb, uh, no regard for the bones of the dead, that when they overstep kind of this, this boundary, if you will, the sanctity of life and basic respect for humanity, at that point, they've abused their power. And so God is going to bring them into accountability, bring them to judgment. And so God kind of uses Amos to name out their sins and to show the Israelites that God does rule, that God does hold them accountable, and accountable especially for how they regard life. Well, that has all their attention. And they're actually thinking, man, this is good stuff. This is good news. Because when God judges our enemies, when he judges those around us, we'll be able to extend our borders. That this is actually going to be a blessing from God, that he is going to kind of vindicate us against everybody else and bring judgment upon them. So Amos has their attention. You can just imagine that they want to hear more. And so he gives them more. And so now we go down to verse 4 in chapter 2. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his statutes. Now it's time, starting to get a little scary because now instead of it being the enemies, it's Judah, the southern kingdom. And while there is a lot of hostility at times between northern kingdom and southern kingdom, fact is it's still their own people. It's still a brother tribe. And so I imagine in one sense, they're saying, yeah, it's about time God make them pay. They're so arrogant down there, claiming that they have the temple, the only place where God should be worshiped. It's about time that God judged them. But that's also getting pretty close to home. And so it might be a little bit nervous time. And the second thing I want you to see with that is that they're held accountable to a different standard. Rather than just kind of the respect for life, they have the law, the Torah, gift from God, the covenant, and they are going to be held accountable. They are going to be judged because they have not kept Torah. They have not been faithful to the covenant. More was given to them, so more is expected of them, and they haven't delivered, so judgment. Amos has their full attention, and we go down to verse 6. Thus says the Lord, you know what's coming. For three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted. A man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profane. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. So now he calls them out. The judgment is coming to Israel. They're not going to escape it. And judgment is coming because of how they have abused the poor. That the wealthy are exploiting the poor and selling them for a pair of sandals. And where it talks about how a man and father go into the same girl, so that God's name is profane. We're probably talking temple prostitution there, that they had temple prostitutes, and through sexual union with a prostitute, you would try to manipulate the gods uh, to come together so that there would be fertility on earth, uh, to bless the land, to bless your family, to bless your livestock with fertility. 
uh, as you engage in, in sex with a prostitute. And then where they laid themselves down on every altar on garments taken in pledge. If you made a loan to someone who was poor, you could take their garments as a pledge. You could take their cloak as a pledge. But if you took their cloak, you had to return it every night because that was their kind of last shield against the cold. And so, what? and if it was a widow, and widows are cold all the time, then you couldn't even take their cloak as a pledge. You just had to loan them with no pledge. And what we see here is those who have had the means to make loans, and they've collected this clothing, these garments, these cloaks from all the people that they've loaned to, and haven't been giving them back at night, they, they take them and they make themselves comfortable as they worship the Lord. Uh, just the, the, the hypocrisy of it, that you're gonna go worship the Lord and make yourself comfortable in the process with things you've taken from the poor. Well, we go on. Amos is just getting warmed up. He has their full attention. No doubt they're upset with him now. Uh, but let's go ahead and go to chapter 3, verse 12. We're going to keep skimming through here. Thus says the Lord, as the shepherd rescues from the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the people of Israel who dwell in Samaria be rescued with the corner of a couch and part of a bed. In other words, they're not going to be rescued. You know, when a shepherd rescues a piece of an ear from a sheep, the only purpose of that is to show what happened to the sheep. You're not really rescuing the sheep and saving the life of the sheep. Rather, you're just showing that what happened, that the sheep was devoured by a ferocious wolf, and you couldn't stop it, but you were able to save a leg bone, a piece of an ear, to demonstrate that you know what happened, that you didn't sell the sheep, that you yourself didn't steal the sheep, uh, that it really was attacked and destroyed. And so that's how Israel is going to be rescued. <laughs> There's not going to be a rescue. There's only going to be evidence of what happened. Uh, he goes on, uh, Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord God, the God of hosts, that on the day I punish Israel for his transgression, I will punish the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. I will strike the winter house along with the summer house. The houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall come to an end, declares the Lord. Again, think about who's in view. Those who have the winter house and the summer house. Not many have two houses. Okay, and houses of ivory, great houses shall come to an end. Uh, chapter 4. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that, behold, the days are coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks. And you shall go out through the breaches, each one straight ahead, and you shall be cast into Harmon, declares the Lord. He is calling the wives of the wealthy cows of Bashan. Now, the insult is not in calling them cows, okay? He's not trying to insult them. What he's doing is he's highlighting the fact that they have it so well. The Bashan was up in the mountains. It's where there was a lot of rain, a lot of good pasture land, grazing land. So if you were a cow, that was where you wanted to dwell. You wanted to pasture there. You were going to have it good if you were a cow in Bashan. And so he's calling, out, calling them out in terms of how well they have it. Don't think that you're going to escape judgment. Don't think that somehow you are insulated off from the tragedy that is coming. Then no, you're actually going to be marched out, strung together with hooks on a line like fish. And he holds them just as responsible as their husbands, that their husbands are doing kind of the oppressive work, the dirty work, but they're demanding it, wanting to maintain their exquisite lifestyle, uh, that their husbands would have all of this wealth to make life easy for them. And so, you know, bring us a drink, you know, from all of your exploits. And so Amos is saying, no matter how wealthy you are, no matter how insulated you seem to be from what's going on, you're not escaping, that judgment will come to you. 
And when the Assyrians conquered people, they would string, they would put hooks through them and string them together like fish on a line and march them off into captivity, extremely humiliating. But we go on, Amos isn't done yet. Uh, we go to chapter five, and this is where perhaps we hear his most famous stuff. So chapter five, I'll pick it up at verse 18. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? See, the day of the Lord, they thought about that as the day when God was going to take vengeance upon all of their enemies. And so they hoped this day would come. And when Amos started his book, when he started preaching about God bringing judgment upon all those around them, they're thinking, wow, the day of the Lord is coming. It's at hand. God is going to bring judgment upon all of our enemies, and we'll be vindicated, and we'll be on top of the world and able to extend our borders. That's what they're thinking, the day of the Lord. And Amos is saying, why are you crying out for the day of the Lord? Because the day of the Lord will mean judgment for you. And yeah, you may escape those enemies around you, but it's going to be like you fled from a lion only to meet a bear, or that you got into what you think is the safety of your house and you're bit by a serpent. And so don't pray for the day of the Lord, because judgment is coming your way. He goes on, verse 21. This is the Lord speaking. I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. You hear what the Lord is saying? He's telling the people, look, I don't want more worship. I don't want more sacrifices. I don't want more noise. That's all it is to me is noise. What I want is some justice. And I don't want it once. I don't want you to think you can just do this day of justice and then go back to status quo. What the Lord is looking for is a people who will practice justice and that that justice, that practice, be as constant as an ever-flowing stream. And Amos just lays it out. And God's saying, I don't want your worship. I want you to live right. I want you to do right by each other. And so that your righteousness would be as constant as an ever-flowing stream. The right doing towards each other, especially the poor. Uh, chapter 7. Um, Amos has some visions, and I want us to look at this for a moment. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, he was forming locusts when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout. Behold, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings, knowing the king got his cut first. When they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, O oh Lord God, please forgive. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. So the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. So he sees this vision of locusts. God's going to bring a judgment upon them, strip the land bare with the locusts. And Amos says, no, nobody will survive. That's too much. So God says, okay, I'll back off. Kind of reminds us of Moses a little bit on Mount Sinai, talking God down from destroying all the Israelites and starting all over with Moses. So Amos, very Moses-like, kind of talks God down here. Verse 4. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord God was calling for a judgment by fire, and it devoured the great deep and was eating up the land. And then I said, O oh Lord God, please cease. How can Jacob stand? He's so small. The Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord God. And so again, another vision of just this fire that's going to consume. Don't know if that's a literal fire, like a forced fire, uh, like they had uh, down in Australia or whether this is like a drought where everything is just consumed and nothing grows. But Amos, again, intercedes, and God backs off. Verse 7, this is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. 
And then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Now, do you guys know what a plumb line is? It's basically a string that has a weight on the bottom of it. And you hold that string up, and so the weight is at the bottom. You keep the weight just off the ground. And what that does is it shows you what is perfectly perpendicular, straight up and down. And uh, construction workers use plumb lines. Uh, Stonemasons use plumb lines to make sure that the walls that they're building are perpendicular to the ground. It's very important that your walls are perpendicular because if they have a lean to them, then they're not going to be able to be load bearing. And so you use a plumb line to make sure that your walls are straight up and down so that when you put the roof on or you put a second story on, that your walls are load bearing and they'll be able to hold up whatever is resting upon them. Okay, and so today you can get a plumb line at Home Depot, sometimes a chalk line, sometimes we use levels and we turn them up on side and make sure something is plumb. But to say that something is plumb means it is perfectly perpendicular to the ground, vertical, and so that it can bear a load. And what the Lord is saying is, I'm going to set my plumb line within the house of Israel, and it will become evident every place where they're crooked, every place where they're out of plumb. And if they're out of plumb, if they're crooked, they cannot fulfill their purpose. And the Lord says, I'm not going to pass by any longer. I'm not going to look the other way. That It is time to get this thing corrected. And I just imagine that the plumb line is basically the covenant and that the covenant, it becomes apparent how out of plumb Israel is. And so if you're a builder and something's out of plumb, you got to get it plumbed up or it's not going to be safe. It's not going to be structurally sound. It's not going to bear its load. And so sometimes something can be so out of plumb that you basically have to dismantle it and start all over again. And that's basically what's going on here. That Israel is so out of plumb that the only thing God can do is dismantle Israel so that it can be rebuilt true to plumb. Because as it is now, God's purpose can't be accomplished. Israel can't bear the load of what God wants to do through Israel. So they're going to have to be dismantled, uh, deconstructed, if you will. Uh, we go further. We get more and more, more and more kind of announcement of judgment coming. Uh, Amos comes under fire himself by the people up there. They don't want to hear him. They tell him to go home. Uh, but he stands strong, courageous, bold. We get into chapter 9. And chapter 9 is the last chapter. And this is absolutely amazing. So chapter 9, verse 11. In that day I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountain shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their own land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. A couple things there to pick up on. One, we see the whole kingdom of David being restored. So kind of a reunion, if you will, between Israel and Judah with David over all, the line of David over all. And then we see, especially for the northern kingdom here, that they will be regathered and that they will be blessed, that they'll come back to the land and God will so bless them that, I mean, the land will be so garden-esque that it will be time to plant and they won't have last year's harvest all the way gathered yet. Just a time of abundant blessing. Okay, here's what I want to make sure you see. That Amos is announcing judgment is coming. The key sin 
for Amos is the injustice, the oppression of the poor. So God is going to dismantle them. They are completely out of plumb with how the covenant calls for people to relate together, uh, for people to care for those who are unfortunate, those who are without, completely out of plumb, completely crooked from the covenant. And so God is going to fully dismantle them and they will be dispersed and they will be scattered. But the purpose of it is to replant them. The purpose of it is to rebuild them. And because they refuse to listen, refuse to listen, refuse to listen, they hear Amos and instead of repenting, they just dig in deeper. God says, okay, I'm going to dismantle. But dismantling is not the end. There will be a regathering and a replanting and a restoring, things being made right, and the land becoming a garden. Okay, so you see the same thing with, Hose with Hosea, right? That where there was kind of the, the sending away in terms of Gomer and letting her go her way, a regathering, a rebellious son, a punishment, but a restoration. We'll see this all through the prophets, that God brings, God brings about judgment, but always for the sake of restoration. Now, Micah is very similar to Amos, and we could spend a little bit of time there. Well, let me go ahead and direct your attention to a couple places in Micah. So Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. So Micah is just a little bit further past Amos, roughly the same time period, again, a century. And just a couple places I wanna direct your attention to. First of all, let's go to chapter four. So Amos chapter four, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and it shall be lifted up above the hills and people shall flow to it and many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and we may walk in his paths. So Micah sees this day and we also find that Isaiah sees it as well. His is in chapter two. But Micah sees this day where God's mountain, the temple, will be above all the mountains and all peoples will come, not just, not just Jews, but all peoples will come to worship the Lord and they want to learn the ways of the Lord. Uh, let's go ahead, take a look at verse 3. He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So this view that one day all the nations are going to come and worship Israel's God, and they're going to be done with warfare, and that all of their war technology is going to be transferred to and transformed into farm technology, and it will be about caring for each other, and it will be about sustaining life instead of ruling life and exploiting life and, and crushing life. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. There's peace. Everyone will have what they need. And no one will be after what somebody else has. Verse 5. For all the peoples walk right now, each in the name of its God. But we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. And so Mike is saying, look, everyone else right now, they're still training for war. They're still exploiting each other. There's still much insecurity, much threat. But as for us, we're going to walk in the name of the Lord our God now, and we'll walk this way forever. So Micah is trying to call the people to see what God has in the future. And if God is going to be the one that everybody worships in the future, then now, of all people, we should be especially worshiping our God and not living like the rest of the nations, trying to exploit each other and war on each other. We go on. Let's go to Micah chapter 6. And this is kind of a courtroom setting. And the Lord is placing Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem, on trial. Hear what the Lord says, arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains, the indictments of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. 
So the Lord is pressing charges against Israel, and Micah's in the southern kingdom, so we're basically talking Jerusalem. And the mountains who have seen everything, they're called upon to make a judgment, called upon to be witnesses. And so the Lord speaks in verse 3, O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak king of Moab devised and what Balaam the son of Beor answered him and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. And so the Lord reminds them in front of the mountains what I've done. How I've been good, how I've been faithful, how I rescued you, how I brought you up out of Egypt and saw you through the wilderness. The people respond at verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? It's like the people are saying, okay, what do we got to do, God, to get you off our back? How much oil do you need? How many rams is it going to take? Do we need to give you our children? And so the people aren't really listening to what the Lord is saying. They're just saying, okay, what's it going to take to settle, to be rid of you? Verse 8, perhaps this is Micah speaking. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. What does the Lord want from them? Very similar to Amos. To do some justice. To do right by each other. To love kindness or to love mercy. Mercy, using your resources to meet the needs of others. Not using your resources to place someone in your debt so that you're actually exploiting them by helping them, but using your resources to help someone at their point of need, to do right by each other, to love mercy, to walk humbly before your God. That's what Amos is after. That's what Micah is after. That's what the Lord is after. And so the 8th century prophets seeing this exploitation taking place uh, we think that much of this exploitation kind of happened as people got into hard times. They would mortgage off their land to somebody who was wealthier. And so the wealthy person has more land, and then they can control what crops are grown there. And instead of allowing people to grow what they need or what works for their village, they have those people stay on their land, but only they don't own the land. But they can stay there, and they work the land, they farm the land. But now, instead of growing crops that are beneficial to the local community, the landowner is saying, you're going to grow crops that I can exploit or I can export to other ports of the Mediterranean world. And as they export those crops, like olive oil, then they grow wealthier and wealthier. They're able to, quote unquote, help more people in need, get their land, and then allow them to stay there as peasant farmers while they export the crop further and further away, more and more profit for the wealthy, and the poor become poor, and they are kept at a very peasant level. So we think that's what's going on both north and south, and Amos, Hosea, Micah, they all call them out on it. We say Isaiah called them out on it as well, but Isaiah is especially concerned with trust. So I'm gonna uh, erase the board here, and we uh, got a little bit of time left, so I want to talk a little bit about Isaiah. And then for Thursday, we'll maybe take a little further look at Isaiah, but also our focus will be on Ezekiel and Jeremiah. So let me go ahead and shut this one down, and I'll redo the board, and we'll take a quick look at Isaiah.